Facebook.com forward slash late night parents. Uh, Twitter.com slash late night parent. And I'm found as on Twitter as Real Ted Hicks. We talk about the latest and greatest in trendsetters in technology, education, sports, uh, product reviews, and we all wrap it into parenting. Want to thank our providers and distributors of the show um, in the U.S. and U.K. And we do this with the best team in the world, and part of the team is here tonight in Richie V. Daddy Dad, what's going on? What's up, man? How, How you, you doing? I'm all good. I'm good. How are you? Uh, pretty good. Dr. Michelle is not here tonight, so tending to some business that she's dealing with at home with the youngsters. We hope everyone is doing well. Um, I don't know about you, but I wear glasses, and I've worn glasses for the past... Mm, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think I got glasses about 15 years ago. Yep. But, um... I wear readers. Oh, you wear readers? Yeah, I have readers. Okay, so you wear readers. I usually wear them for uh, staring at the screen and nighttime driving. Mm-hmm. Um, so I say this because it's hard finding a place that will give you great, you know, eye care and you know, optometrist that you can trust yep. and all the above. So I wanted to give a quick plug to my good friends at Eye Care Vision Services of Valley Stream. Ah, oh, you, you found My someone. MV, excuse me, MYVSVS.com because for Valentine's Day, they're running a wonderful type of offer. I mean, that's Fendi, Guess, uh, you know, Christian Dior, you you name it. All the custom frames. Yes. So love isn't blind. It's a little blurry. <laughs> okay. But I want to give a big shout out to um, this eye care place. And I will be vi- not only visiting them in the next upcoming weeks, we're hopefully going to have them in here in the studio to talk about the benefits of getting your eyes checked out. But along with that... What's going on in your world? Because we have our special guest, I believe, is in the queue, but her name is Miss Janet Allison from Boys Alive Foundation. Ah, okay. Um, but she, she's going to hold on in the queue a couple of minutes. I wanted to know what's going on in your world, or you want to do this after? We'll do this after. You know, if we All have, right. the host is on the line, we don't want to keep the host waiting. Um, so I say we can welcome Miss Janet Allison now. All right. So. From the Boys Alive Foundation, um, our friends uh, at WGBB might not know her, but I know her uh, through social media and through our podcast that's been airing for the past three years, Late Night Parents, none other than Miss Janet Allison. Janet, how you doing? Hey, I'm great. Awesome to be with you. Wonderful, wonderful. It, Janet, we, we met... I'd like to say a year or two ago. It's been a Time while. Flies, Ted. I think it's been at least two. It might be three. Oh, Not my. Sure. I know. I know. So, Janet, I, I'll tell you this much. The wonderful world of social media was the way that you and I were introduced to each other. Um, you have a lot on your plate. because. But I want to start off by saying thank you. Thank you for telling me about my son without actually physically meeting him. <laughs> because in our last discussion, we did a 60-minute discussion. It had to be at least two years ago. Um, mm-hmm. Janet, you explained characteristics, traits, things. You, you, you cured some of my fears. And you kind of, you know, helped pave the way to getting me to have a better understanding of myself. Wow. wow. That's my mission. That's my passion. And, you know, so much of it is if you just know it, then you can see it and act upon it and know how to adjust your parenting behavior. Or, you know, this is also, as you know, this is male-female relationships, adults and 
adult to child, teacher to child. It's it's all of us, and it's so much about when we can understand the other, whether it's men understanding women or female teachers understanding their boy students. Then you know, just isn't the world a better place? And and what I have found is that so many boys and men feel so uh, much more understood and we can make them not be bad and not be wrong and not be, you know, um, chastised for, for their behavior because it's a, it's a burden. It's a lot when you're always being told no and being told to stop and why can't you just listen? All those things are, you know, they, they hurt our soul. They hurt our spirit. Janet, I, I, here's the next situation that I've run into, and it's a very timely topic. Help my son hate school. How did you know? You, I mean, you're talking about my son. You're talking <laughs> yeah. about a lot of dads that are out there, dads and moms. Their sons are like, oh. Yeah. They come home, and I tell you, so I put together this webinar, and that's the title, How My Son Hates School. And we feel as parents so helpless, and what do I do when my son comes home? And and the reason I created this is because I'm hearing from parents of preschoolers and kindergartners all the way through high school and and you know we see it in a little different guise along the way but you know it might be the teenager who doesn't want to get out of bed or uh, the middle schooler who isn't turning in his homework and you have those homework battles every night i don't know if that's happening at your house ted but oh, yes it is it's, it's all the resistance and the or the boy that comes home i had a mom tell me her eight-year-old son came home and said you know mom the teacher picks all of the girls to be the be the helper, the star child of the week, it are all girls. And so, you know, that, that boy was able to articulate that and he could see this difference. And what happens so much in school is that girls become the gold standard of behavior. And we expect our boys to behave like our girls. And we're, it's just not simply not going to happen. It's not biology. Uh, boys need to be active and need to be moving in school. And so when we don't give them the context to do that, recess, fluid seating, you know, that they can get up and move around, then we, that's, you know, we're already even at an early age saying that our boys are wrong and they're, they're not okay. There's, you know, why can't they sit still? And part of that is the uh, 90, something like 93% of early, early childhood and elementary school teachers are female. And they, many of them don't understand their boy students. Janet, also in the studio with me is Rich Valdez, a longtime friend of mine and hi, dad Rich. of hi, three sons. Yes, hi, how uh-huh. are you? I, I I'm good. Heard. Good, good. Glad to hear. Glad to hear your 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 viewpoint and what you're putting forth there. Because even as you were saying it, I was thinking to myself, "Wow, is this just a case of you know one gender not fully understanding the other, which we know is common from being a child to being a grown adult? Um, you know, what, is it just more a matter of perspective than it is uh, a behavior issue?" And it, it sounds like that's that's key to um, what you've analyzed and what you've been able to discover. Yeah, and part of that, too, is when we think about education, which, you know, school, the kids are in school for a thousand hours a year. And we have created school in a way, you know, kind of typical school. Of course, there's those outliers, but we've created school only in the last eh, 200-ish years to look like it does now. And, and that's a very girl-centric model of education. Very verbal, sit still, listen to the teacher. But when we look at the timeline of history, this is not how boys learned. Girls can kind of adapt and flex into that, but boys learned by doing. They were out you know, behind the plow, they were building, they were blacksmithing, they were learning at the hands at the 
feet of uh, master craftsmen. Mm -hmm. They weren't just being told information. So they were experiencing it with their bodies and able to, you know, move things around and create things. And that is how boys, most boys learn best. Now, did you say that having the availability of, of sports, because again, as Ted mentioned, I have three sons and my two of mine are out of college, um, you know, in mm -hmm. their, their early 20s. My youngest is in his sophomore year of college. But throughout their, their academic careers, they've been they've played three or four sports every year. Would you say that just having the availability there of, you know, keeping that giving them something to to burn off that energy because boys are boys and it sounds like you have a full understanding of that you need to keep them active you need to ha keep them going would you say that um having this you know sports available can assist in possibly you know fending off some of this i hate school or i don't want to go to school type attitude or feelings absolutely sports sometimes is the only motivator to get some boys to school but I think we also have to be really careful of that sport culture because if it's too much focused on the athletics and not the academics, then we get ourselves into trouble. Right. So if the coach can, I had one dad tell me, you know, the coach in the locker room, the, the, the talk was first academics, then athletics. So to really promote and support young boys, if they're going to play a sport, that's great because absolutely they do need to burn off that energy, but we need to hold academics as important as, as sports. And then Rich, there's all those boys who don't want to play sports, mm -hmm. who aren't sports oriented. And so we have to be really careful to not let that sport culture take over and make the boys who don't play sports feel wrong or bad or different. We've got to have things that are um, as, as held in as high esteem as sports are. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. Janet, I just got a quick question for you <clears throat> because I, I do want to learn about more about the webinar and days that you're going to have it um, this upcoming week, but I got to tell you this much. <clears throat> so at my son's school, um, you know, they had uniforms. And I've got to tell you, I have had an ongoing discussion with my son's teacher about his tie or the lack of tie, him wearing a tie, mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. the point where I had my son, oh, excuse me, my wife and I, we have our son wearing the school sweatshirt with the tie under the sweatshirt the teacher was unable to see it. And do you know I've re I've received or oh, and or corresponded back with my, my my son's teacher about three or four times uh, in regards to the tie and following you know orders and direction and overall you know this is the dress code. And my wife got a little you know perturbed, and I said no 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 let's hang in there let's see where this is going to go. Mm -hmm. to, to the point where I had my son walk up to the teacher and say, okay, because I had wrote in one of my emails to, to the teacher said, okay, we'll make sure the tie is on. I'm sure he has it on. Maybe you got to, you know, you got to take a look. Maybe the shirt is a little too big to the point where I said, mm -hmm. you, you have to dress for, dress to impress. And mm -hmm. I had my son um, one day she asked him, his teacher asked him, and he said to her, dress to impress, and he had to pull the sweatshirt down to show the tie. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I got to tell you, Janet, I didn't know if that was him being truthful, him telling a story, as you know, uh, most nine-year-olds do, or if this was really happening. Because I said there can't be that much going on. So when, when I share a story like you, is it something familiar? Is this one-off? What do you think? Well, I'm not quite sure what you're asking me. So he's, <laughs> resisting, he's resisting the dress code and the teacher's insisting that he yes. dress according to the yes. dress code. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Well, I mean, I, and I'm not sure how this will land, but if there's a dress code, then he needs to conform to the dress code. Right. And absolutely. It's his job to not want to conform to the dress code, but it's, I think it's up to us as adults to also um, help him see the connection with what he's doing as a nine-year-old and looking out into the world as, you know, as an adult. And at, at nine, you're learning. And of course, you know, some days you're going to mess up and that's okay. And when you go to your job at wherever, you, as an adult, you will you know, there's a dress code. It might be that you're an auto mechanic and you have your uniform on or a construction worker, but everyone has their uniform for whatever their occupation is. And this is just practice for that. Gotcha. So I don't know if that answers your question because I'm not sure if you agree with the teacher or disagree uh, with the teacher. I, I'm, I'm one to agree with the teacher. Uh-huh. And... I said, you know, I was at the point of how do we get the emails to stop referencing the tie? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I would love to see more important things happening than right. that. That's, that's kind of a side note and absolutely should be paid attention to. But how is he doing otherwise? How is their relationship, the teacher and your son, otherwise? Is, is she coming across, I'm assuming it's a she, my yes. bad, but yes, no, um, you're right. I think you said that. Um, <laughs> and uh, um, to you know, can we focus on something different? Can we right. let that rest? If that's the only thing she's needling him about, let's let's back off of that for a while, and and build and nourish the relationship right. on right. a different level than than that because. You know, if boys like their teachers, and maybe you guys can remember a, a certain teacher that you had growing up, but if a boy really feels seen and heard by his teacher, male or female, oh my gosh, that child will move mountains for that teacher. That relationship will be so exquisite and he'll be willing to do anything for that teacher, but it's up to the teacher to help uh, foster that strong relationship. That that's true, and and I think I don't know if I mentioned it or not. I I said you know I also took ownership of the situation because I said okay, maybe he wasn't. Maybe I need to check him every morning to ensure that he has that tie on. But it it did get a little silly to a point where I said okay, so there's no behavior issues, homework no, is done, no academic issues, no ac academic mm -hmm. issues. Yeah, we're we're talking about a tie. Yeah, yeah. And I said, okay. And I had to pull my son to the side and say, okay, so we're talking about a tie. And I said, here are the emails. And I just sc yeah. scrolled through on my phone really quick. I said, mm -hmm. do you see this? This is about you not wearing your tie. Mm -hmm. Which I thought was crazy. I, 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 yeah. I mean, but I respect the teacher. Sure. You yeah. know? And but, how to shift it out of that deadlock interaction and absolutely if he's nine he may still re need reminding because he's a boy and he's nine and he's you know his brain is changing every day so help him help him remember the tie and <laughs> it's it's like having a toddler you know you just have to go through those steps again and practice again that's true and yeah they're just bigger and have better vocabulary <laughs> and minds of their own. <laughs> hey, this is Late Night Parents. We're talking with Janet Allison from Boys Alive. Um, Janet, as we get ready to wrap up, so what's happening this week? I am so excited, Ted. This is going to be an awesome week. We are. I am teaming with another woman. Her name is Jennifer Fink, and she has buildingboys.net. And she is a... Uh, an author but she's also the mom of four boys and so she has she's been in the trenches for many many years her oldest is just off to college and so we've teamed together around this issue of school and how do we support our boys in school so we're giving a webinar twice this week it's totally free and we we did a practice run last week and we were so excited because 
I just got to say, we're awesome. We're awesome together. <laughs> it's so much fun to have a team and to be able to play off each other. And we're so, we both, I come from the education perspective. She comes from the parenting perspective. And we just have so much to share with parents and um, reassurance, but also here's what you've got to look at if your son is, you know, complaining about a stomach ache, hasn't finished his homework, says he hates school or the teacher hates me. So we're doing this webinar. It'll be about an hour and it's uh, totally free. The um, place to register is boysalive.com forward slash webinar. Really simple. And you'll choose Tuesday or Wednesday. Tuesday Eastern time will be on in the evening. It'll be 9 p.m. And Wednesday will be on at 1 p.m. Eastern time. So you can pick whatever works best for you. And um, don't tell anybody, but we'll send a replay if you can't make it live. We know we know live is best, but um, we also know you're busy. So spread the word. I mean, teachers need to hear this. Parents sometimes feel like they're really alone and isolated when their son comes home and complaining about school and and we think, oh, everyone else is doing okay. What's wrong with my child? And we are here to reassure you that you are not alone. Also that you have to get ahead of this and really help him. And also pinpoint, you know, what's the area? Is it the teacher? Is it the um, environment? Is it his academics? What's going on? So we'll really be diving into that and giving some practical strategies and support. Perfect, perfect. Yeah. Janet, tell us best ways for any of our listeners to get in contact with you. If, yes. they, are, if they are unable to make the webinar, but they still want to follow you and... Absolutely, and please do. I mean, there's just so much important work that needs to be done. So you can find us on Facebook. If you just, uh, you know, search for Boys Alive, you'll find our private Facebook group there, which is just an amazing resource. Boysalive.com is the website. And again, boysalive.com forward slash webinar is the, um, the saving your free seat, your registration for that webinar coming up this week on Tuesday and Wednesday. Perfect. Perfect. Janet, I want to yeah. thank you so much for taking the time out this evening to join us and discuss your upcoming webinar and helping me and the Hicks family along with understanding our son. We want to thank you once again. And we will be speaking, like, I'm sure we're going to be speaking, hopefully after this week. I want to do, a, do a, a catch up with you <clears throat> on the webinar and best practices. And I think I'm going to join the Tuesday 9 p.m. session. Awesome. Awesome. It'll be great to have you there. Great to talk to you, Rich. Same here, and Janet. Thank you for in joining touch us. Soon. All yeah. right. Thanks again. Okay. Mm-hmm. Take care. My pleasure. And that was Janet Allison from Boys Alive, the Boys Alive Foundation. I want to thank her for joining us, Rich. And those yep. stories are true because I've shared them with you <laughs> offline. The tie, the, the infamous tie. tie. I've never run into a situation where I'm just like, really? Yeah, I you know, we like you say we've spoken about this a couple of times, and I, I I'm leaning on that side of okay, if there's nothing else going on, right? Academics are great, homework right. isn't on time, behavior is fine, and he sometimes doesn't wear the tie, and you want to focus on this one thing. Let it go. Sounds like you know energy being spent in in a, in a, in incorrect direction, but let that's just me. Let it go. Uh, let it go a little bit. A you little, know, right. A little. A little. A little. Exactly. I'm not asking for much. Right. Catch him, say, hey, put that tie on over there. And, right. And leave it alone. Let and, it go. And, and there you go. Wait till the next day, put that tie on. And oh, I bet you one or two days, three or four goodness. days, he'd start putting the tie on. I, we hope. We we definitely hope. A um, lot to cover. Um, Paulie Millen is um, so gracious to join us to talk about her book, one woman, three men. And I just want to read a, a quick excerpt from it. Or um, can a life and relationships change completely between April and July? It can, as Pauline Middleton shows us in a new romance novel that outlines the evolution of a relationship between one woman 
and several men. The story is based on uh, Middleton's premise that a modern day woman actually needs not one man, but three, one for sex, one for intellectual stimulation, and one to help around the house. With that, uh, it's, it's my pleasure to invite Miss Pauline Middleton on. Pauline, how are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Hi, thanks for having me, Ted. Oh, please, please, please. Thanks for just taking the time out. Um, I know you're very busy. You're everywhere. I see you, I mean, <laughs> digitally, I see you everywhere, but I know you've traveled the States, you've traveled in, 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 in different countries, and you're promoting your book. I, I want to thank our, our good friends um, that were, were able to connect us. And mm-hmm. tell us tell us about the modern love premise. Tell us how you came about. Tell us who you are. Just let our listeners know. Um, I'm going to decrease right now so you can increase and tell us about One Woman, Two Men. <laughs> thank you, Ted. Um, well, uh, it was a model that I invented for my own life uh, some years back when I had a love life that was really, you know, not working out at all. I had been married and had a daughter with a man, and then we divorced. And then I met this other guy, you know, briefly afterwards, and then uh, I found out that he was cheating on me. So, you know, I was looking at, at uh, my love life, and I was also looking at the love life of my uh, girlfriends. And I was seeing many things that really didn't match, you know, that many people were quite frustrated or unhappy or not having a partner and not happy about that. And I figured, okay, I I think I need to try something else. And then I wanted to to create a dating profile because that was, you know, the thing she did uh, back then. Still do to some extent, even though Tinder has taken over. But um, when you create a a dating profile on a dating site, there are a lot of questions you need to answer about yourself. You also need to tell about what you want and what you don't want and so on. And I found out that, you know, there were many things I wanted. And it helped me to be more concrete in defining myself when I had to fill out all of these things. But I also knew, you know, that you cannot actually go out and, and ask to be met on all the areas in your life that you want to because that, that's not realistic. Um, so I chose the three most important areas, and that is I, I like to talk, I like to discuss things, politics, life, love, etc. cetera. Um, I also like to have a varied and fun sex life. And sometimes, you know, people think that that's uh, just, you know, that's more or less evident that, that both men and women want that, but it's not all men that want it. And then I live in an old house and I needed help with some of the things uh, because I'm very good at helping somebody, but I'm not very good at at finding out how to solve the practical issues. And then, you know, when I was sitting there looking at these three areas, I got the idea, okay, maybe I should get a guy for each area. And then I could find out where things uh, continue to go wrong. And uh, and then I had that idea and I was like, okay, I'll do that. And then I put up a profile saying I'm looking for three men. One to talk to, one for sex, and one for practical stuff. So. <laughs> perfect, perfect. Well, I do have some questions for you because I yes. received the soft copy of your book. Um, <laughs> so I just started to read that and kind of delve into it. So I, I guess my first question is, um, how did your your friends and family react to the three men model in your life? Yeah, well, in the beginning, I didn't really tell anybody about it because okay. I wasn't quite sure how, how I would react. You know, it, it was um, it was somewhat of a, a daring move for me, the background that I have. You know, it's quite ordinary background, but still, you know, I was like, okay, well, Saying that I want a guy for sex, that's like saying, okay, uh, you know, sex is important to me. But how will other people look at me? Will they think I'm a, you know, a cheap girl or or some of these other negative words that we use whenever women and sex are associated? Or, you know, what will happen? And when I have more than one man, you know, that will also be provocative for a number of people. So I, I didn't tell anybody. Uh, but then I, I, I lived with this model for a year and a half, 
and you know, uh, I was divorced. So every second weekend, my daughter was with her dad. And that meant that in that period, I could, you know, experiment as much as I wanted. Um, and then I made a diary of all my experiences. And then some years later, I decided to write a book about it. Because each time I, I brought up some of my experiences, people were really curious. You know, they really wanted to talk about, oh, is there a different way of living your love life than what I'm actually experiencing now? So, uh, so it, it was very, you know, it was very different how I treated it in the beginning and then later on. Um, and then I also would say that uh, when the book was published, I was uh, somewhat worried my daughter because right. she was uh, she was 13 years old at that time and I was like thinking okay well you know I didn't want her to, to feel she had to have an opinion about it and I didn't want to actually have her dealing with it at all because it was grown up issues so what I did was I, I told her that I was going to publish a book and I was uh, going to be in the media and so on and I, I said I don't want you to, to watch any of it or, or listen to it and whenever people, if people contact you and ask about this book, just say, well, you know, it's my mom. She's a bit crazy. She has all these projects, and I guess the book is just one of them. And, and she did that. And uh, so for the, you know, the first couple of years after the book came out in Denmark, she never talked with anybody about it. And people respected that as well. And then when she got older, you know, some of her friends thought that it was cool, and some of her friends' moms. I think Pauline just dropped. Uh, we're going to try and get her back on here. Let's see if we can um, get her back on here. She just mistakenly dropped. So uh, let's see. Folks, we're going to see. Oh, there she goes. Yeah. Hey. Well. Wow. No, I'm I'm back again. Yo, that's good. That's good. I was happy. I just wrote down your your phone number. I was getting ready to dial you. Uh, I just wanted yeah, to jump yeah. in and say, so your, your your daughter was was a teenager. She was around thirteen. Um, yeah. So the question I was going to say is, or did you not? I was going to say, weren't you worried that she would pay the price for your endeavors? I mean, because at, at the age of thirteen. Kids can be, you know, preteens or teenagers can be pretty tough. Sure, sure. I was I was worried about it. And I also was thinking whether I should maybe publish the book under a synonym. Yes. Uh, and I was also considering not publishing the book at all. Uh, but, you know, then I was thinking, well, you know, if, if we don't, if I don't thread some new path, then she might end up having the same love frustrations as I do. Because when I look back from when I was her age, I don't think a whole lot of things have changed the way I would have thought it would have changed. You know, I, I still think that, that young people, uh, at least here in Denmark, they, they, when they get to be teenagers and they get to, you know, be interested in the other sex or their own sex, whatever, mm -hmm. you know, they, they get experiences in, in drunk situations or in parties or it's, it's not very... Um, how should I say? I don't think there's a whole lot of respect around it. You know, it's it's a little, it's still a little oh shabby and something people don't want to talk about. And, okay. You know, so I've also also always talked with her about sex whenever she needed to talk about it. That's good. That's good. Um, so my next question for you is. Uh, do you recommend this this modern love model for women of all ages? Um, yes, and at least here in Denmark, it is women of all ages who've taken uh, who've taken it on. Uh, I just got a, a an email from a woman who's seventy years old, and she oh just loved the book. And, <laughs> yeah, and she was going to use it as inspiration in her in her couple life. So you know, you can use it directly, and you can also use it indirectly, uh, because the more you can actually uh, let yourself, um, how should I say? thread new paths or try something else. Let's say you're stuck in the dating rut or you're like really just not having a very well-functioning love life. 
well, it's a good idea to get an inspiration and think things differently because it frees your energy, it frees your spirit, and it also frees your attitude towards other people. You know, you might be more accommodating, you might be more curious of going out with somebody that is not the normal type you normally go out with. You know, it's it's very good to think about things in a different way. So, so Pauline, you're married now, but I want to ask you, yeah. when you were going through this model, I mean, is it the fact that did you dislike monogamy? Um, no. I, uh, I, I think... Um, Everybody, when they're in love, are quite monogamous. <laughs> because, you know, when you're in love with another person, it's, yes. it's this special person that you want to be with. So so I don't think that, uh, you know, um, I think that's, that's very much part of it. And, uh, and I also live a monogamous relationship now. Um, but, but I have been very uh, happy about the fact that I have, with, the, with this man that I'm married to, Sting, uh, I've been able to talk with him about these things right from the beginning. Because when okay. you've had a three-men model, uh, there are many th- more things that you can actually bring up. Or you bring them up, you know. I had many, f- f- much more fun dates with guys because it's possible to speak in a more um, uninhibited way and more tolerant way about these things. And, and you know, the f- interesting thing was also when I published my book, I was over sworn, swum by or overwhelmed by how many people contacted me and wanted to tell about their experiences that were a little out of the ordinary or a lot out of the ordinary. Many people had experiences like that. And and they asked me for lunch and coffee and so on. And, and some of them also wanted advice. And that's when I decided to set up my love coaching uh, company because I was like, oh, there's so many people needing advice. And I have some experiences here that people can use. So, so Pauline, I got to ask you the most important question for me, and you might laugh, is can men use this model too and look for three women? Um, yes. I, I had a, a friend of mine. He was uh, very into my book and thought it was a fun. And then he said, you know, at some point in my life, I lived with three women. And I said, well, would you like to write a book about it? He said, yeah, I've, I've, I've actually, you know, long to write a book for years and I've tried a couple of times and so he ended up writing a book called One Man Three Women oh, but okay. you know what the way he defined the three roles was different because he defined them as the the sexy femme fatale for sex the soulmate for sex and the young wild at heart for sex so you know the sex aspect was as a right. part of all three roles for him. And and that, together with the experiences I had with men, has made me much more aware of how important sex is for men. It's also uh, important for women, but I think it's it's in different, uh, in different manners. And I think at least it was a surprise for me that it was so important for men because very few men were direct about it. You know, I had to kind of pull it out of them how important it was. But then once okay. they said, yes, it is really this important, then they felt much better about it, actually, you know, right. saying, yes, yeah, this is important for me. So I also want to contribute. I also want to take initiative. I also want to, you know, it, it was much better to actually be frank about it because then you can use it as an active component in your relationship instead of having it something that you are a little of, you know, holding back or not actually standing by your desire. So so that's a, a thing I, I definitely got out of the model. You know, it's, it's really good to stand by your desire, whatever it is. I'm going to look into this this book, One, One Men, Three Women, because like you said, I want to find out from the author, okay, the sex, sexual component is one thing, but what about, was there anything else? I mean, because it, it, it from the description that you just provided, it's like, Men just care about sex, and that's it. There's, there's, there's nothing else. And I'd like to think there's something else, but I'm a man, and you know, I kind of know what what rules. Um, my next yeah. question for you. But, oh. Well, I have I have one more comment regarding this. Uh, okay. If you okay. allow. Yeah, of um, course. Because I I think uh, that that you can say that there are for women there are maybe. 
uh, a number of paths uh, to love, uh, you know, and sex is one of them. Whereas for mm-hmm. men, there is one path to love and it passes through sex. So, you know, I think for men, there is also more than just sex. But I think sex is a really important component for men. And, and I think that's fine. You know, it's, it's, uh, we shouldn't be the same and we shouldn't be, you know, similar to each other. It's okay to be different uh, among genders and, you know, generations and so on. So I noticed that you chose the roles of the philosopher, the lover, and the handyman. If you had to choose another role, what would that role be for a, a man to fill? Mm. Uh-oh, did I stump you? Well, I <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, because, <laughs> well, it touches upon an area that I, I have identified with many people who are frustrated with love is that they expect far too much from a partner. They want all their needs fulfilled by one person. And and in a way, you know, that it's not helping you, it's not helping your partner, it's not helping your relationship. It's much better to concentrate on the three most important areas and then to be able to compromise in the rest of the areas. Because, you know, the more you kind of have expectations towards each other, the more you also risk, uh, you know, getting disappointed. Mm, so so I, I don't... I, I can't really define a, a fourth area, but I okay. would say that for other for other women, they may define these three roles differently. You know, let's say you really uh, love uh, taking long hikes. Well, then it would be a partner for that you may be looking for instead of the philosopher or instead of the handyman or whatever. Uh, it could also be somebody who's really into sports or it could be somebody who is into cooking. You know, any right. kind of thing that is really important in your life. And where you want would like a match, that should be the way you define it. Paul, uh, we're speaking with Pauline Middleton, um, author of One Woman, Three Men. Pauline, I do have a question, and it's it's about the green-eyed monster. The green-eyed monster, mm-hmm. uh, we like to say, is jealousy. So, how does someone deal with jealousy if they are dating more than one person? Well, that was actually the most often reason for changes in the three positions, Uh, you know, because uh, most of the men that signed up for my model, they wanted uh, wanted it to lead to sex at some point. They were willing to, you know, that we had some exchanges before, before, and, you know, we had some talks or they helped with practical stuff, but they wanted it to lead to that. And and then when they found out that, you know, there was somebody else there and they they started comparing themselves in their own mind to whoever was having this position because they never met each other. But, of course, they knew of each other's existence. So, so I mean, it was difficult. And uh, mm. I've since made a lot of, uh, you know, I've, I've, uh, the people I've coached in, in love, they, the green-eyed monster is there. And, the, gotcha. you know, it, it's, it's, um, it's very much about strengthening your own base and grounding yourself in yourself because uh, the Green Knight monster is also a lot of imaginations going on and yes. taking control of you. And, and it's not reality. It's, it's quite seldom reality is like that. Uh, but, but, you know, we can get completely worked up about it if we, if we don't kind of nip it in the in the bud, like nip it as early as possible and, and deal with it. Uh, I got a question. What about the moral values? Like, do those matter in modern love, in, in your model? Um, well, I think uh, the, the love life today is, is not as, um, how should I say, it's not as following the traditions as it was maybe 20 years ago or 30 or 40 years ago. You know, we, we're, there's so many things that you can define yourself today. So, so actually earlier on you could just follow the traditions and then everything would be all right. It's not really, it's not so much possible today because traditions are changing and you know some of your friends may live in completely different manners and and people you meet live in different manners and that means that you really need to ground yourself in your own values and to be able to look yourself in the mirror every day 
So I think moral values are are actually even more important today than maybe they have been before, because you don't get them by uh, automatically from societies. You you need to work on it yourself and define what do you think is is appropriate behavior. Pauline, I got to ask you this 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 question right here. After writing a book like this, how do you what what topic would you approach for a follow up book? Like, I mean, this is kind of like a game changer and it's also a showstopper. So your follow up, I would think, would have to be something just as um provocative. What's 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 in your queue or or what are some of your thoughts for you know, what your next book that you're going to write, or is there a next book that you're going to write? Well, there is, um, yes, there def- definitely is. I have a couple of uh, different tracks that I can choose to follow, and I've made notes in, in both areas. One track is that I will uh, leave the main character of this book, and I will start following her best friend. Ah. Uh, she is, her best friend is more sexually explorative, She's more daring. She's more uninhibited. So that can really be, you know, a more uh, erotic novel, uh, but but also in the sense that, you know, let's try to redefine things. So so that is, yeah, that that's one track. The other track could be saying, okay, I will continue to follow my main character. And now that, uh, you know, uh, she's not in the end she is uh, she doesn't have um uh, as many men as she does in the beginning <laughs> i don't want to <laughs> give away too much okay uh, but you know how will she live that with the experiences that she has gotten you know does it change uh, the life that she's uh, embarking upon when the book ends and how does it change it uh, because it changed it for me uh, you know when i uh, And it looks like we just dropped Miss Pauline Middleton again. I did have a follow-up question for her. Hopefully, she can just dial right back in. She was um, discussing the the question I had for her is how you know what how do you follow up a book like this, One Woman, Three Men? And hold on, she's back on. <laughs> hey, Pauline, there you go. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know what happens. It's like it takes no. us ten minutes or so, and then it. Just I know, cuts off. I know, I know. So, oh, so yeah. you were you you were mentioning the following up, you know, the the the, the different tracks you can go. I I did want to yeah. say, you're so. Are you currently in the states right now, or are you in Denmark right now? I'm in Denmark right now, and first of April I'll be in uh, Los Angeles, and then oh, now yeah. I'll have a book tour of a month. <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. Are you coming to New York? Yes, I'm. I am uh, on the 18th of uh, April and until the 29th. Okay, definitely, definitely. Hey, mm-hmm. I, I wanted to know um, if you could tell our listeners be, uh, best ways of getting in contact with you via social media, um, your coaching. You know that that you mm-hmm. also do ways. The best ways to find out about everything about Pauline Middleton. Yeah, well, I have a Twitter profile, which is called uh, 1W3M, One Woman, Three Men. And then I have a website, which is called modernloveandsex.com. And on this modernloveandsex.com, uh, I have, uh, you know, the four more descriptions of my book and uh, I'm blogging there, and I also have uh, a, a booking possibility for any coaching that people might be interested in. So modernloveandsex.com. Perfect, perfect. Um, Pauline, want to give you a round of applause? Thank you very much. <laughs> and I want to thank you for taking the time out tonight um, and look forward to following your, your, your book tour. And definitely when you do it in New York, I will definitely show up one of those dates because I want to definitely get your autograph and just, just the concept itself. Game changer. Great. Definitely game changer. <laughs> yeah. So I want to thank you so much for joining us. 
Well, thank you so much, Ted. And I'll I'll be in touch when I'm in New York. Okay, thanks thanks again. Okay, thank you. And I was Miss P- Paul. Oh, I have to have my theme music. Yes. <laughs> yes. Very true. Every superhero's got to have a theme music. Very true. I have to think about that. Oh my goodness. But um we had an article on late night parents and I know Dr. Michelle can talk can speak to this about holiday travel checklists for asthmatics cuz this is oh. that time of year yep. the weather is changing we could see yesterday it was 64 65 degrees and today mm-hmm. it's 41. 30 it's 39 out there right now stop it it wasn't that cold it's out 39 degrees <laughs> Yes. Well, you know it's cold anytime I start wearing my turtleneck. (laughs) That's a sign that it's cold. Yeah. So our patients and our audience out there who are asthmatics, this is the time of of year where we start to have them coming into the office coughing, Mm -hmm. wheezing. And more Mm -hmm. times than not, it just starts as a common cold Mm. that sort of progresses. Um, usually with the asthmatics, it's the extremes of temperature, either when yep. it's very hot or very cold. Right. One of the key things is to make sure you always have your medicine. So the times to really be concerned, are you an asthmatic? Yeah. <laughs> yes, I am. That's why I was giving you that look, and I lost my inhaler, but we'll talk about that later. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> but you know what really bothers me? Is when a patient comes in, and mm-hmm. they're like, well, I have asthma. So I'm like, so where's your inhaler? Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't have one. Mm. Don't have one at all? That's don't a different one story. at all. So I said, you know what? I'm going to write a prescription for you to get mm-hmm. one. Mm-hmm. Well, I haven't had an attack in years. And I said, well, you know what? You if know. you don't yep. have an attack in years, mm-hmm. all you're going to be out in this particular time is the money for your copay. Yep. $15 right. or $20. That's all. Right. It so be. go yeah. ahead, pick up your medicine, have yep. it on hand because you never know when there might be an incident. Yep. Right. And I remember seven days after I graduated from medical school, we were on a cruise, Mm -hmm. and one of my guests had a full cardiopulmonary arrest that was triggered by the candles that set off her to have an asthma attack. Mm. So it's not something that you want to be in a situation like that where you have to be dependent on somebody else to yep. make sure that you stay alive. Yeah, right. very true. So always just carry your medicine with yep. you. Right. Even if you're just going to the store, make sure you have it. You don't know. You might walk past somebody in the supermarket who has very strong perfume mm-hmm. or cologne because mm-hmm. we're not going to mm-hmm. be biased here. And that can set off. An asthma attack. Mm -hmm. So let's always try and be prepared. So if you're traveling, especially parents who are traveling with their children, the first thing that you should pack is your child's medicine. Forget about the clothes. Clothes you can always get easily because Walmart's everywhere. (laughs) You have the super Walmart. (laughs) But always bring the medicine. Pack your medicine first. And, of course, make sure you have the number for your child's doctor just in case. And especially even as an adult, adults have asthma attacks, so we're not immune. And more times than not, we're very neglectful, so we'll make sure that the children have their medicine, but we'll neglect that we have ours. I'm sorry. You were just looking at me. (laughs) No. no, I was not picking on you. I know you weren't. I know you weren't. Don't worry. All good. (laughs) <laughs> the kids have theirs. So, in addition to knowing uh, where your medicine is and having your medicine all the time, it's important to know what are your triggers. So, is your asthma triggered by the cold? Is it uh-huh. triggered because when you get an upper respiratory infection? Is it triggered because you're stressed? Because stress is another trigger that will cause someone to start wheezing. Mm-hmm. Maybe you've been exercising lately, and uh-huh. as you're exercising, you might have exercise-induced asthma. Have your medicine handy at all times. I've learned my triggers over the years. <laughs> I've, dust. Dust is one for me. Really? Yeah. Yes, but I guess since we're talking about this time of the year, one of the key things that um, is sort of, I guess a mission of mine is as we approach the holiday time, a lot of people start to have anxiety or depression. Mm. And it's something that we need to make sure that we pay attention to our family, our friends, 
be an ear. Make sure that you reach out to someone who you know might go through these problems with anxiety or depression, especially around the holidays. There's a lot of people who, if there's been a death recently, this is going to be their first holiday season without their loved one. Everyone reaches out to you initially when the event happens, but sometimes they sort of neglect you during the holiday time. So we have to really pay attention. And it's not that someone's always going to be crying and moping, woe is me. Sometimes they internalize everything, and when they're by themselves, that's when it comes out. So I think that would be my tip for the week is to start to pay attention more to your family and friends okay. and reach out. And even if you just do a phone call, just to check in to see how you're doing. Mm-hmm. We already talked about cyberbullying. Right. So let's sort of step away from our electronics. <laughs> mm-hmm. don't, don't go on Facebook and say, hey, how you doing? No, <laughs> that's, that's not our form of communication. No. So either pick up the phone or just uh. ring the doorbell and, and try and do a, face to, a face-to-face visit. Even this past week, even um, I was studying for my boards and one of my um, friends, her father recently died. And I was like, well, you know what? I need to run because I need to just de-stress. And at the same time, I need to stop by their house. So Mm -hmm. I ran to their house. Okay. Stayed there a few minutes and then I ran back home. Right. Two for one. Right. 5K a day. Yes. <laughs> and it was a sunny day. Yeah. So, but, you know, let's try and, and make more contact with people as, as opposed to through our electronics. Perfect. 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 Great. Really. <laughs> and, and like I said before, this is, I guess we made it a uh, Ask Dr. Michelle segment, but... Yep. It, it counts. It, it's for everyone. But it's it's an official ad. No, it is. Show. It is. It really Without is. Without the theme music. <laughs> there will be theme music. There will be. 